Okay, years. everyone. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we have some post uh, kind of adverts coming up um, and these are people who have sent them in. So um, if you sent yours to Ancha or one of us uh, and you're expecting to show one, um, keep your eyes peeled and your ears open for me saying your name, potentially mispronouncing your name. I apologize for that in advance. Um, let me show, I'm going to flick through the posters and basically we're going to have one to two minutes just to outline what the study is about and uh, just sort of advertise it. Um, this is obviously really difficult to do a poster session um, digitally. Uh, we don't have beer, for example, um, but we're going to give it a go. Okay, so if I can share this, you should be able to see that now, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's fine. Okay, okay so, um, so I'm Ségolène Berthou, working at the Met Office, and I've, and I've uh, looked, looked at, at a future store, future winter storm, storm over Northern, Northern Europe with, with a convection permitting model. So it's, it's only UK uh, Met Office models here, here uh, but, but I intend to do this with the multi-model from, from uh, EZCP. So, so basically, basically the number, number of storms in the present and the future are given by the GCM and we just want to look at every single storm that go into the convection permitting model, model. Um, and uh, then look at different sectors of the storms and compute statistics on different sectors of the storm to see how the characteristic of individual storms change in the future. And, uh, and uh, you can, can see, see in the middle, middle um, uh, uh, the courts, so we have a dry intrusion, a warm sector, and a northeast sector. And then, and then we look at, when you look at the right, at total intense precipitation per sector. In green, it's the present day winter values. In orange, it's the future winter values. And in green, it's the autumn present values. And we see that. The warm sector gets more intense rainfall in the future and it looks uh, quite close to autumn, winters, uh, autumn storms in the present day. So the orange gets close to the green in every sector, but it, it is um, very much the warm sector that, that um, dominates the, the signal. So yeah, key message is winter storms, future winter storms look like autumn. Uh, storms, storms, at least in our model. That's, That's it. it. Oh, hello. Okay. Um, Off you go. I'm, yeah, I'm Tamsin Palmer. Um, and so this is <clears throat> some work we've been doing on looking at the range of CMIP climate projections from the, from the CMIP models. Uh, for the European regions for UCP using sub-selected model ensemble. Um, so before I start, I'll, before I forget to say all this is online on the um, on the EGU page. If you want to see, there's a full there's several slides on there which show us all in more detail um, all these results. Um, and if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me. Um, so the projections, basically, first of all, we looked at um, how projections changed um, for a different subselection based on sort of different processes and different performance indicators. Uh, so we had one which the scene at 13, they're shown um, uh, here, is um, that was based on uh, a performance uh, parameters for um, performance indicators for the UK. And we looked to see whether or not it um, applied more widely to Europe. Um, and then on the top left, um, did a slightly different approach, which was based on um, a paper by Vogel et al, um, 2018, um, which looked at uh, uh, land atmosphere um, feedbacks, uh, particularly in central European regions. Uh, so we looked at how that changed the potential, simply on that basis, changed the potential projections. Um, and then finally, um, up on the right, um, I started analysing all the CMIP6 um, ensemble and comparing that to the CMIP5 for projections for the, the UCP regions and time periods. Yep, I should also add that this is all based on the UCP um, regions and uh, established time periods. Um, so I think that's it. So if um, 
if you're interested, please have a look at my presentation that's online and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. That's brilliant. Thank you, Tamsin. Um, and next up we have, this is going to surprise you for me. Um, ah, it's uh, Paolo Stocchi. 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 Um, Stocchi. Brilliant. Hi, can, you, can you hear? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Please go yeah. ahead, Paolo. Hello, everybody. I'm Paolo Stocchi and I work for the National Research Council. Uh, this work is in collaboration with the ICTP and uh, the poster present a first analysis of Regsian for, for convection permitting simulation, comparing to the driving 12 kilometers convection parameterized simulation, forced by Ajam for two 10-year uh, scenario projection, one historical and one for far future. We analyze the precipitation uh, variable, uh, focusing on the Alps and the Southeast domain, and we perform some statistical uh, analysis uh, as uh, Nicolina Ban already presented in her uh, presentation. Thanks to Nicolina for sharing some scripts. And uh, we also uh, analyze some uh, PDF analysis. Uh, anyway, uh, I have uploaded the, the poster, so if you are interested, you can find it or you can uh, write me by, by email. Um, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Paolo. Um, next, we have uh, Pana, <laughs> Panagiotis. Panagiotis, but I don't think this is being presented by him. So no, uh, I'll be presenting on behalf of uh, Panos. Uh, so uh, here at the uh, at Altages, we're uh, working with the climate data to uh, to. Uh, uh, to uh, work with that to get into the impacts and I've, uh, that we just saw in uh, Sanne Meijs' talk, a uh, significant uh, issue is uh, our coastal zone. They have quite some uh, risks. So what Panos has been looking at is uh, especially uh, the sandy coasts, because here in Europe we have quite some sandy coasts which are vulnerable to being eroded away. And to make projections of this potential uh, sandy beach shore uh, erosion. He's been looking into well, what are the different components of the da data set you use, like how important is your uh, scenario of your climate change and how important are your uh, data sets of your location of your uh, erodible sandy beaches or the slopes of your beaches. Uh, so he's, uh, he has uh, published work on this, it should be on the slide, and he's also busy with interesting follow-up uh, research on this. So uh, please feel free to contact him if you're uh, interested by this uh, slide uh, uh, or want to know more about future work. Sorry, I mute myself. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and next we have Daniel before from Oxford. Yeah, great. So in this study, we assess in how far we can obtain uh, skillful and reliable info information beyond the upcoming decade by uh, constraining uh, projection, uninitialized projection using decadal predictions. And in this study, we used uh, the framework um, to constrain temperatures over the North Atlantic Gyre region. And this is on the right hand side here so um, there are also some results so if you look on the top right plot on the right hand side this is the root mean square error over lead time and the gray line this is for the uninitialized projections and for the blue line this is for the decadal prediction and as you can see for the first 10 years the decadal prediction has a lower error than the uninitialized projection so it has some added value um, this is well known more interesting is the blue line, uh, sorry, the green line, which is um, the result for the constraint uninitialized projections, like constraint using the decay prediction. And what you can see, this ensemble doesn't only have like lower RMS error over the first 10 years, but also uh, beyond the upcoming decades, so for uh, years 10 to 15. Um, another plot which illustrates this nicely is on the bottom here. Um, in black, a uh, thick black line is the observed. Um, temperature anomaly over the North Atlantic Gyre region. Uh, the gray band is um, the projected 
temperature variability um, from the uninitialized projection. And the green line is for the constraint ensemble. And you can see nicely that the constraint ensemble is better able to um, depict the observed variability um, over this region. And yeah, please contact me if you have more questions. That's great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, next up is me. Um, okay, so I'm going to time myself here. Um, so, so this is this study was about trying to use large ensemble data sets and to try and calibrate them towards climate to to assess how well you can get climate projections um, for Europe out of these large ensembles. Um, and to do that, we to do this, we basically borrowed a bunch of techniques that are often used for shorter range forecasts um, that t that are really used designed for using ensembles that tend to be um, over or underconfident um, and calibrating them towards observations. So these are very very parametric um, methods, um, and and effectively what we did is you take the, the large ensemble data set over a bunch of different regions and you fit it over the observed period. And, and you see how that changes the future projections up to, as in the figure on the right-hand side here, 2060, which is kind of the focus of the ECP project. Um, and it turns out that, the, the, and the way we kind of analyze how well this, this works is by using what we call an imperfect model test. So this is by using a bunch of CMIP5 models where we know what the answer is, um, withholding the future data and applying it to those models as if they're observations and seeing how well these calibrations work compared to what the raw ensemble is doing. Um, so, uh, if we take if we cut to cut a long story short, it's, they sort of send, tend to work quite nicely for temperature, where there's quite a clear signal in the observed period. For precipitation, they don't tend to work quite as well, but they do tend to produce um, uh, more reliable, in a statistical sense, uh, calibrated ensembles in the future. Although they don't, although there isn't much signal. So. But 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 we tried this in, in two different data sets, two different large ensembles, um, and kind of and that's what's shown in the right hand side here. Um, the the light the the red lines uh, show show the 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 raw ensembles or the or the, the, the reddish lines, so the raw ensembles from two large ensemble ensemble data sets, just for Central European temperature, um, and the blue lines show once they're calibrated towards the observations over this period up to say 2017, um, and you and you find that. The, initially, the models are quite different, but when they're calibrated, they tend to give a more consistent picture. So, um, yeah, anyway, you can read more about this. This is a, a paper that we've submitted to Earth System Dynamics Discussions, um, and it turns out anyone can see that at any time. So you can go on there and you can read it, and you can also read uh, uh, the reviews, however bad they are or however good they are. Um, yeah, so please go and read it. Uh, anyway, who's next? Uh, it's Carol. Hi there. Um, hi, I'm Carol McSweeney, so I'm over at the Met Office. Um, we've heard in the first session today from David Sexton about um, some of the work um, that's happening under the UK CP18 um, project um, to develop storylines based on um, our perturbed physics ensemble scenarios. Um, and so with this work here, we're taking a step back from that um, and doing a regional assessment of that 15 member um, PPE. Um, a key motivation for running the Bataille Physics Ensemble at quite high resolution, so it's run at 60 kilometres atmosphere and a quarter degree um, ocean, um, was to provide simulations that are realistic in their representation of large scale dynamics for Europe um, and so that they would be well suited to storylines approaches and allow us to explore what might be what, what future weather might look like. Um, so here we present some evaluation results across a number of metrics. So we look at uh, jet latitude and strength, weather type frequencies, the winter storm track and blocking amongst other things. Um, and we do find that in almost all cases the level of realism is at least as good at if not improves on um, a set of good or well-performing um, CMIP5 models. Um, but please do go and see more of these results and hear more about that performance um, from in my presentation that's online. Um, and feel free to follow up with questions or comments um, by email. That's great. Thank you, Carol. Uh, uh, so next is, is Deborah. Yes. Hi, everyone. So um, our study was, was about the reliability of the climate predictions. And the goal was to study the impact of initialization in terms of reliability 
For this, we used rank histograms and also the Jollyfin Prim and Primo test statistics for 30 different regions across the world and three different model ensembles. So um, the underlying concept in the Jollyfin and Primo statistics is that you, um, you decompose the chi-square statistics into different components. Um, those are the slope coefficient and the convexity coefficient mainly. And basically, when you have a large slope coefficient, it means that your focus is biased or has a wrong trend compared to observations. And when the convexity coefficient is large, it means that you have some dispersion errors in your focus. So this is what you see in the, in the plot on the bottom of the, of the screen. So this is uh, for the columns. Those are the different regions that we studied. And then you have the first line is the convexity coefficient, then you have the slope coefficient, and then you have the difference between initialized simulations and historical runs for these different coefficients. And the, three, the four different triangles are retired by different post-processing methods that we used. So the main uh, message here is that um, both the initialized simulations and the historical runs are generally unreliable and this is, is often due to dispersion errors in the forecast and historical runs. And you can see that the added value of initialization is rather low um, and that you really need to calibrate and bias correct your forecast in order to have reliable uh, estimates. So if you want to learn more, you can have a look at my display, which is on the EG website already. And please make some comments on this. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Deborah. So uh, next is, uh, is, it, is Mariana, is this you? Is this yes, yes. Ah, good. good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mariana Benassi from CMCC. And this is just to advertise our research on the mid 20th century cooling event in the North Atlantic. Here, uh, our, uh, our aim is to assess the relative role of external forcing and internal variability as driver for this event. So basically we want to adopt uh, this event as a case study to gain an insight in a process known to be an important source of decadal predictability for European climate, which is of course North Atlantic SST variability. Here we will take advantage of both NCAR large ensemble and the NCAR decadal prediction large ensemble. And the main results we have obtained so far based on the non-initialized large ensemble point to a um, crucial role of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation in leading uh, the SST signal of, um, with a lead time of about 10 years. Uh, this is pretty much an ongoing research. Uh, Alessio Bellucci and I have uploaded an extended presentation with our main results on the EU system. So please feel free to leave us your comments and, and, and feedbacks. We will be happy to answer you. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Mariana. So the last slide that we have here is uh, Marjana, Mariana. Yes. Thank you all who okay. are still here. <laughs> Um, I'll keep it short as I'm the last person. Uh, I'm from Deltagus and at Deltagus we are in the ESP project to make the translation from uh, climate information to impacts. So we're also looking into hydrology. So uh, Nicola and Lina just presented the high resolution convection permitting uh, climate models which we are using for hydrological uh, uh, modeling. So we've been bothering uh, some of uh, you in, within EUSP with a lot of questions about that the last couple of months. And uh, apart from this one-on-one -on -one putting these uh, models on, uh, on our gridded hydrological modeling, we are also looking into a more engineering approach. And the engineering pr approach uh, focuses on deriving statistics from your uh, rainfall information to then make a, a translation to what are the impacts of such extreme precipitation events, which are expected to increase in the future. So as, as you oh, my, may be well aware, such high resolution uh, model simulations are quite computationally expensive. So the duration is quite uh, small, uh, short. 
So we're looking into uh, pooling data from different locations to uh, derive more robust uh, statistics. And uh, what quite some cl climate uh, scientists may have uh, noticed, when you try to check your data, you are re uh, reliable and observations which can be difficult to combine, uh, come by in different regions. So we've been looking into a methodology to derive uh, regions for which you can pull the data uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way which makes sense, uh, you, uh, which does not rely on your uh, uh, observational station information from your rain gauges, but the, uh, uh, relies on, on more the physical processes of uh, seeing a region which is homogeneous as a region which uh, which gets the same extreme uh, weather, which can be expressed in your uh, in meteorological indices, this was successful uh, in a previous study for it Italy, but as you can see in the middle of uh, this slide, there wasn't that much uh, thing to discriminate for uh, in the region we chose to test it on. So you can see in the plot most of the arrows of your moisture transport, which is shown here, have more or less the same uh, direction. So we couldn't discriminate in this field different regions. So uh, and hoping that that meant well, you can uh, uh, pull everything together. That turned out to be uh, well, just too large uh, region. So we're now working on in uh, proving this to uh, get some uh, robust statistics from the climate modeling data. So uh, if you have any questions about this, uh, feel free to email. I think mm, people will not, uh, uh, and um, I'll keep it at that. Well, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. I'll stop sharing my screen now. I just wanted to check before we kind of move on and finish this bit. Was there anybody who didn't send it, didn't send in a one slide who wants to show it now? Now would be the time to speak up if you want to show something or forever hold your peace. Hi, Christopher. It's Peter from ICTP. I uploaded actually the post this morning. Ah. New website. Oh, okay. Do you have one slide you maybe want to show now if, if it's to hand? Yes. Rita? Oh, go ahead. Just a sec. Okay, so here we present the applications of the reliability ensemble averaging method, which gives a measure of the reliability of simulated climate changes from ensembles of different model simulation. The method is applied to Eurocortex regional methods, regional climate models, and to CIMIP 5 and CIMIP 6 global models. And uh, we apply it to the entire European domain and to three different regions, the three stress regions for the mid and far future relative to the reference period. And so, yeah, so these are in this poster, we, we present the method and the, the results. And our next aim is to, to apply the method also to evaluate the reliability of the extremes of precipitation. So, Comments and questions are more than welcome. Brilliant. Thank you, Rita. 